Here we are, the last section of the review. Although this is primarily a psychopharmacology review, I thought I would be amiss if I didn't include at least a quick overview of other available therapies for the disorders that we have discussed. By focusing only on psychopharmacology, it's easy to get the impression that drugs are the only things that matter in treating mental illness. In fact, there are a wide variety of options available to suit your patient's individual needs. As some background, there are several limitations to the exclusive use of pharmaceutics to treat mental illness, a few of which we'll touch on here. First, drugs don't change an environment. All mental illnesses have both a biological and environmental component, and while drugs can treat the biological side, they cannot change an environment that may be causing or exacerbating people's symptoms. Second, drugs cannot change thought patterns. Illnesses such as depression and anxiety often involve recurrent negative thought patterns, which drugs cannot alter in the same way that therapy can. Third, several drug classes, such as opiates and benzodiazepines, have significant addiction potential and, in a minority of cases, can even end up causing more problems than they solve. Fourth, nearly all drugs have some negative health outcomes, whether that is something as simple as transient diarrhea or as life-threatening as agranulocytosis. Fifth, drugs exert a financial cost, especially those that require lifelong maintenance therapy or those that do not have generic options available. Finally, the long-term outcomes of many psychiatric drugs is simply unknown. The majority of studies supporting the use of psychiatric drugs only evaluate up to a year, or two years at most. A large question remains about what effect these drugs will have over a 10, 20, or 30-year span. For these reasons and others, it is necessary to be aware of other treatment options available for these patients. We will briefly go through each of the modalities here, examining what they are and when they are appropriate. There are a few high-yield nuggets to be found in this section as well, so pay attention. First, we have psychotherapy. Until the past few decades, this is what psychiatry was known for. Contrary to existing beliefs, psychotherapy does not always involve a Freudian tell-me-about-your-mother kind of approach, and there are many modalities within psychotherapy that are effective for different disorders, in the same way that different drugs work for different pathologies. Let's briefly review the major types of psychotherapy, as well as what disorders they are indicated for. Psychoanalysis, which was popularized by Sigmund Freud, was the dominant mode of psychotherapy for much of the last century, and while its use has decreased since then, you can still find psychiatrists and psychologists who practice it, mostly in large cities such as New York or San Francisco. Research shows that psychoanalysis can be effective for a variety of mental disorders, including depression, anxiety, psychosomatic, and personality disorders. However, positive results from psychoanalysis can take a long time to develop, one to two years to see results for the majority of psychiatric disorders. Because of the cost involved and the length of treatment required, psychoanalysis is generally not a first-line therapy to refer patients to, unless if they are independently wealthy or would like to pursue it for themselves. For this reason, it is unlikely that a general practitioner would ever refer a patient out for psychoanalysis. Cognitive behavioral therapy, abbreviated CBT, is a very high-yield therapy to know, as it has the largest body of evidence behind it of any form of psychotherapy. It has been shown to be effective for a variety of disorders, from depression and anxiety to PTSD and chronic pain. In contrast to psychoanalysis, it also has an increasing evidence base for its use in schizophrenia as well. The evidence for CBT, and for any kind of psychotherapy in general, will never be absolutely conclusive, as there is no way to blind patients or doctors to treatment status, which automatically introduces many different types of bias. Nevertheless, despite some methodological difficulties, the evidence seems consistent in its support for CBT. The theory behind CBT involves the link between one's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Thoughts create feelings, feelings create behavior, and behavior reinforces thoughts. As an example, if someone grew up with a physically and emotionally abusive parent, they would likely end up believing that they are worthless and unlovable. These thoughts then begin to repeat in the brain automatically, creating feelings of depression. Feelings motivate us to act one way or another, so someone who believes that they are worthless and has no energy to do anything could end up staying in bed all day, believing that nothing they do is of any value. This behavior of staying in bed all day ensures that they actually do get nothing done, further reinforcing the original thoughts of worthlessness that started the cycle. The goal of CBT is to break this chain, often by attacking the thoughts that began the cycle to begin with. Once somebody no longer has automatic thoughts of worthlessness, they may start to feel better, leading to more days out of bed doing things of lasting value, which itself may lead to feelings of self-worth. This is the theory behind CBT, and current evidence seems to suggest that it works. Furthermore, the length of time required for CBT is often much shorter than psychoanalysis, making it more cost-effective and therefore more likely to be covered by insurance. For this reason, CBT makes an excellent first-line treatment, either instead of or in addition to pharmaceutics, which is a high-yield point to note. 
There are several other types of behavioral therapy that have specific uses. One of the most famous examples is exposure therapy, which has proven useful to treat specific phobias such as spiders. When used to treat phobias, exposure therapy forces patients to face their fears, slowly at first, such as just by thinking about silly looking play spiders, then seeing spiders in person, and finally even having a spider crawl on your arm. Therapy is done between each of these steps to address the feelings of fear and panic that may arise. Exposure therapy for specific phobias is one of the most successful psychotherapies available, with high rates of success even after a single session. Research shows that the effects tend to be long-lasting, with 90% reporting a reduction in fear and 65% saying that it erased their phobia entirely, even years later. Because of its success in treating a common condition, you should know about exposure therapy. Exposure therapy has also proven effective for PTSD as well, especially in soldiers with combat-related trauma. One of the primary symptoms of PTSD is avoidance, which prevents patients from forming more positive associations with their memories. By using virtual reality simulators, we can effectively place soldiers back into the situation that triggered their symptoms, which, when combined with intensive therapy, has proven remarkably effective at treating symptoms of PTSD. The next type of therapy is closely related to CBT, but was developed specifically for borderline personality disorder. Since its introduction, DBT has proven to be very effective for treating borderline, which is especially remarkable considering that medical treatments have not shown efficacy at correcting the underlying thought processes of the disorder. DBT focuses largely on mindfulness. Mindfulness describes the state of being aware of both the external environment and of internal thoughts, which works to focus one's attention and calm emotions. We won't get into the theory too much, but just know that when you see DBT, think D-borderline therapy. The next type of psychotherapy, supportive therapy, is an approach that integrates aspects of many models of psychotherapy, but relies primarily on building trust between the patient and the therapist through emotional validation and encouragement. While supportive therapy has some evidence behind it for a variety of disorders, it has been shown to be most helpful for adjustment disorder, in which the patient experiences significant psychological distress related to life events, such as a divorce, losing a job, death of a family member, etc., but does not meet the criteria for major depression. This has shown up on tests, including USMLE, so try to remember that for adjustment disorder, add just a supporter. Another approach to psychotherapy is systemic or family therapy. This is a broad term, encompassing things like marital counseling for couples going through a hard time, as well as working to restructure a family to reduce a child's behavioral outbursts. This type of therapy is generally practiced by marriage and family therapists, known as MFTs. Because family therapy often looks to change variables, such as family stability, that are much harder to define than the outcomes that psychiatrists focus on, it is more difficult to do empirical research on the outcomes of this therapy. However, the research that has been done appears to be positive, so you should consider systemic or family therapy for patients with an unstable or unhealthy home structure. Another type of therapy that we will talk about is Applied Behavior Analysis, or ABA. This is a type of behavioral therapy that relies on the principles of operant and classical conditioning to modify maladaptive behaviors. ABA is perhaps best known for its use in helping children with autism to gain normal social and functional skills, but in recent years, it has expanded its focus to anything where behavior plays a role, whether that is helping patients to take medications regularly or encouraging the use of seatbelts. The evidence base for this field is rapidly emerging, and you are likely to hear more about it in the coming years. For practical purposes, consider ABA and diagnoses of autism and other behavioral anomalies. Support groups for mental health, such as Alcoholics Anonymous or Emotions Anonymous, are, in effect, a type of group psychotherapy. While it can be difficult, if not impossible, to perform a true randomized controlled trial on support groups, the available evidence does show that it may be effective for some psychiatric disorders, resulting in fewer hospitalizations, improved satisfaction, and decreased stigma. Therefore, support groups can be recommended as a generally low-risk, potentially high-reward intervention. The last type of therapy we'll talk about is art therapy, which includes things such as music therapy and dance therapy. These approaches are sometimes utilized by occupational therapists for patients during psychiatric hospitalizations. There's not a ton of great evidence one way or another, but patients do seem to enjoy it. Moving on, we will discuss medical procedures that are used to treat mental disorders. While psychiatry is not known for being a procedure-heavy field, there are still a few procedures that have proven helpful at relieving psychiatric distress. The most famous psychiatric procedure, electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, was used frequently in the mid-20th century, then fell out of favor in the 1970s when most people associated it with the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. 
Since that time, it has made a bit of a comeback, with recent research showing that ECT is still one of the most effective forms of treatment available for severe depression, schizophrenia, mania, and catatonia. Therefore, it should be considered as an option for patients who are non-responsive to first-line medical treatments. While ECT is not a painful procedure, there are some side effects, most importantly a risk of retrograde amnesia, usually involving loss of memories in the weeks and months before treatment. This is a high-yield fact, both for boards and for counseling patients before beginning ECT. This video shows a simulated case of electroconvulsive therapy being given to a patient. Once under the anaesthetic, a psychiatric doctor trained in ECT will apply two electrodes to the patient's scalp for a few seconds. The electrodes pass a small electrical charge through the brain, inducing generalised seizure activity. The seizure is briefer than spontaneous seizures, typically lasting 15 to 45 seconds. Another set of procedures used to help psychiatric disorders is electric brain stimulation, which encompasses ECT as well as other modalities such as deep brain stimulation, vagus nerve stimulation, and transcranial magnetic stimulation. The jury is still out on exactly how helpful these treatments are, so you won't have to be aware of them for any significant reason, although you may have patients who use them or are curious about them. Psychosurgery was used more often in the early and mid-20th century, usually in the form of frontal lobotomies, but is rarely used today due to more effective and less invasive options being available. There are a few high-profile medical centers that will still perform psychosurgery for treatment refractory OCD, but otherwise it is a rarely used intervention that you shouldn't need to know too much about. As our last section, let's focus on a few non-medical treatments that have proven effective for treating some psychiatric disorders. Nothing here is too high-yield for boards, but I would encourage you to become familiar with these approaches, as your patients may have questions about them, and many are probably using them anyway. First, we have nutrition. Nutrition plays a role in all aspects of health, and mental health is no exception. In particular, a Mediterranean diet, one which is rich in olive oil, beans, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and fish, along with moderate consumption of dairy, wine, and meat products, has significant evidence supporting that it is effective at preventing depression in populations. As with all studies on nutrition, there are some methodological difficulties that prevent these from being the highest quality evidence, but there are enough studies now to suggest that there may be a link. In addition, a Mediterranean diet has been shown to reduce the risk of heart disease, stroke, and other major causes of mortality, so there's really no downside to recommending it to all your patients, depression or not. Despite the popularity of dietary supplements for mental disorders, the majority of supplements have no solid evidence behind them. However, there are four that have been shown to be effective for a variety of these disorders, which we'll go over now. The first, St. John's wort, is helpful for mild depression and even rivals traditional antidepressants in these cases, although antidepressants are still superior for moderate to severe cases of depression. Another supplement, known as S-adenosyl methionine, or SAMI, is well established for the treatment of even more severe cases of depression. Next, omega-3 fatty acids have gained a modest body of research to support that they may augment traditional antidepressants and mood stabilizers in the treatment of depression and bipolar disorder. Finally, supplements containing melatonin, which is a naturally occurring hormone related to the sleep cycle, do appear to be helpful in treating insomnia related to jet lag or shift work disorder. Exercise is another lifestyle modification that has good evidence showing its efficacy in preventing and treating mental disorders. People who exercise regularly have, in addition to better health outcomes, improved sleep, increased energy, lower stress, and improved moods. Physiologically, exercise increases the amount of circulating serotonin and endorphins, and this increase is noted even several days after exercise. Of course, for patients with severe mental illness, just getting out of bed to go exercise can be a challenge, so this recommendation is not always appropriate. For mild cases of depression, however, exercise remains a valuable component of treatment. One form of exercise in particular deserves special mention. Yoga has been shown to be particularly effective at modulating the stress response, which plays a significant role in depression, anxiety, borderline, and chronic pain conditions such as fibromyalgia. It's thought that, in addition to its role as exercise, yoga is actually a form of mindfulness, which we talked about before in the context of DBT. This focus on mindfulness has been shown in studies to reduce symptoms of PTSD and depression in up to 70% of patients. So for patients who are willing and able to exercise, yoga can be an excellent adjunctive treatment for psychological stress. 
Acupuncture is a popular treatment option, especially for patients seeking more natural cures. Acupuncture is thought to work by stimulating the release of endogenous opioids, similarly to a runner's high. There is some modest evidence that acupuncture may help for chronic pain conditions, which could potentially help your patients avoid the side effects and risks of dependence associated with opiates. It should be noted, however, that acupuncture has not been shown to be effective for any psychiatric condition and should not be recommended for this purpose. Another option that has proven to be popular with patients are emotional support animals for conditions ranging from PTSD to social phobia. Like service dogs, emotional support animals are protected by law in many states, but unlike service dogs, they are not licensed and do not have to undergo specific training. The evidence thus far is inconclusive, but generally in favor of emotional support animals. In any case, for patients who request them, there is usually no problem with permitting them. The final point that I'll make in regards to non-pharmacologic treatments of psychiatric disorders is that encouraging social integration is a key component, if not the key component, of both mental and physical health. Study after study after study has shown that those who are more socially isolated experience worse health outcomes, and that those who are integrated into a social group experience more robust recovery from illness. Therefore, encouraging your patients to remain active and social, whether that's at work, school, church, sports leagues, game nights, family, or friends, is a crucial recommendation. Before we end, let's just do a quick wrap-up of everything that we've studied so far. We learned about the three rules of neurotransmission, which tie together our study of psychopharmacology. We learned about the eight major neurotransmitters, as well as mnemonics, to remember each of their diverse functions. For antidepressants, we learned that SSRIs are first line, with TCAs and MAOIs reserved for refractory cases. CBT and other psychotherapies are also helpful. For antipsychotics, first and second generation are equal in efficacy, but differ in their side effect profile. Remember that clozapine, while extremely effective, is reserved for refractory cases due to the risk of death. Antipsychotic dosage forms differ based on the clinical situation. For mood stabilizers, remember that antipsychotics are used for acute mania and that antidepressants generally do not work for bipolar depression. Lithium is the most effective mood stabilizer, but if the patient cannot tolerate it, other options such as valproic acid or lamotrigine may be used. For anxiolytics, remember that benzodiazepines are the most helpful for short-term treatment. Other options, such as buspirone, SSRIs, and or psychotherapy are better for long-term treatment. For insomnia not related to other causes, the antihistamine doxylamine is a great first-line agent. For analgesics, remember the pain ladder and use it to titrate analgesics to avoid the problems associated with overuse. For specialized forms of pain, use different drug classes, such as duloxetine and nortriptyline for chronic pain, or gabapentin for neuropathic pain. For stimulants, remember that all stimulants are about equivalent in efficacy, with a 70% response rate. Non-stimulants are less effective, at about 50%, but also less prone to abuse. For patients with comorbid depression, consider bupropion. For anti-dementia agents, recall that no medication can halt or reverse the progression of dementia. However, some drugs, most of which act by increasing acetylcholine, can be helpful for treating symptoms. For recreational stimulants, remember that the signs and symptoms are tied together by the sympathetic nervous system. Also remember that smoking cessation is the number one most important thing you can do for your patient's health. Remember that meth and cocaine have significant abuse potential. For depressants, remember that, in contrast to stimulant withdrawal, depressant withdrawal can be deadly. Use a benzodiazepine taper to treat this. Recall also that heroin is the single most addictive and dangerous recreational drug. For the hallucinogens, remember that these are, as a class, the least dangerous group of recreational drugs. HPPD, which can occur after chronic hallucinogen use, is a high-yield syndrome. Remember the phrase, it's all in the eyes, to recognize toxidromes from different drug classes. For other modalities, remember CBT and DBT and what disorders they are indicated for. Remember that ECT is very effective, but reserved for treatment refractory cases. Finally, know that there is evidence behind the use of diet, exercise, and social support for treating mental disorders. Finally, for those who are not going into psychiatry, recall the PsychMD mnemonic to remember those situations in which you will need to refer out for a higher level of care. And that's it! We've gone over a lot of material in these few hours, and I hope it wasn't too overwhelming. If this video helped anything from psychopharmacology to stick in your brain, then it's done its job. Thank you for your time, and if you have any suggestions, criticisms, concerns, or have developed any good mnemonics of your own, please let me know and I'll do my best to update this. Thank you again, and best of luck in your studies.